As a 16 year old kid in 1999, if you asked me to pick one movie that defined my high school experience, my answer would probably be the Wachowskis debut film, The Matrix. It was inventive and visually groundbreaking. It featured so many quotable, memorable moments that it was a meme long before memes were even a thing, and it completely reshaped the culture. It had one of the coolest soundtracks in cinema history, and most of its amazing stunts and incredible action sequences still hold up today. I might even argue that The Matrix was the first genuine blockbuster to successfully integrate philosophical ideas and a social critique without sacrificing entertainment value. And in fact, it's those ideas that I want to talk about today. The Matrix deals with big and sometimes silly metaphysical or epistemological questions like, are we living in a simulation? Is there such a thing as free will? And even, what is reality? But I actually think its popularity and longevity has to do with a theme that is even more fundamental, more primal, awakening. Ultimately, I think The Matrix is really about leaving the comfort and security that comes with simply accepting all the claims and values that are provided to you as a child and developing your own beliefs as you experience more of the real world and learn to question and challenge authority figures when you grow up. For decades, we've all had countless opportunities to see and experience eye-opening realizations about the lies we've been told by people we're supposed to be able to trust. Each of us could have thought seriously about these cases and learned the value of questioning the narratives pushed by government, media, and by organizations with an interest in convincing us to think a certain way. If you've ever personally pushed through the pervasive fog of media manipulation and authoritative lies that routinely misinform our society, if you've ever experienced an epiphany from learning a verifiable truth that contradicts the narratives you had been told to believe, you have probably felt this sense of awakening for yourself. That quintessentially human experience is such a formative part of most people's lives that almost everyone, especially teenagers, can relate to it. Which is why The Matrix is still one of the greatest and most influential science fiction films of all time. But a lot of you might still be living in The Matrix right now, so I figured I'd take a serious look at the prophetic movie that started it all on this episode of Out of Frame. It's hard to imagine anyone having not seen The Matrix, given how much it's ingrained in popular culture, but on the off chance that you haven't, let me give you a quick synopsis. It opens with a woman skillfully evading what seem to be government agents using superhuman abilities. We're then introduced to Thomas Anderson, a computer programmer who's chronically late to work and in trouble with his boss. Either you choose to be at your desk on time from this day forth, or you choose to find yourself another job. The thing is, Mr. Anderson moonlights as a hacker under the alias Neo. Late one night, he gets a coded message to follow the white rabbit. And after following her to a nightclub blasting Rammstein, he meets the mysterious woman from the opening scene, Trinity. Hello, Neo. How do you know that name? I know a lot about you. Trinity talks to Neo about the Matrix, but also warns him that he's in danger. They're watching you, Neo. She's right. The next day, men in black show up to Neo's office, but just as that happens, he gets a phone call from a legendary man named Morpheus, who attempts to help him escape. No way! This is crazy! There are two ways out of this building. One is that scaffold, the other is in their custody. You take a chance either way, I leave it to you. Neo isn't ready for any of this, so he's captured by the same agent who was chasing Trinity. Now, more than perhaps any other character on screen in the last several decades, Smith, played by Hugo Weaving, is the epitome of the evil government agent archetype. He is, quite literally, the man. And he wants Neo. You're here because we need your help. We're willing to wipe the slate clean give you a fresh start. And all that we're asking in return is your cooperation in bringing a known terrorist to justice. Neo rejects the offer. You're going to help us, Mr. Anderson, whether you want to or not. This is where things start to get weird. 
Neo wakes up in his apartment, not sure if what he just experienced was real, but then he gets another call from Morpheus to arrange a meeting. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. The Matrix. Do you want to know what it is? According to Morpheus, nearly the entire population of humanity is living in a simulation created by sentient machines who have taken over the world. The machines are keeping billions of humans alive and plugged into a global neural network in order to use them as a power source. Like everyone else, you were born into bondage, born into a prison that you cannot smell or taste or touch. A prison for your mind. I'm no engineer, but it really seems like sustaining all that life would take way more energy than whatever human bodies actually generate, but I guess this is the part where we have to suspend disbelief. The main thing is just to accept that everything about the world as we know it is a lie. And if Neo wants to find out more, he's going to have to be unplugged from the simulation and wake up to reality. It is from this scene that we get one of the most memorable and mimetic concepts in pop culture history, the red pill. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. This idea, the red pill, is one of those things that has permeated our society. It's become synonymous with the idea of waking up to a truth that most people aren't aware of. It's about questioning authority and challenging the narratives and stories that we're all told by our governments, our teachers, our news media, and even our parents. In The Matrix, only a small percentage of people are observant enough to see the flaws in the system, and even fewer have what it takes to accept the harsher reality for what it is. <sighs> why, oh why didn't I take the blue pill? <sighs> Taken too far, it's easy to see why the red pill concept can sometimes be associated with insane conspiracy theories. But setting aside wilder ideas like flat earth and fake moon landings, our authority figures actually do lie all the time. It shouldn't be particularly controversial to point out that politicians and government officials aren't very trustworthy. And there are a lot of things that people are taught in school or get repeatedly told by the media that simply aren't true. I think this is why a lot of us experience red pill moments as we grow up. It starts with parents and teachers limiting what we're allowed to know, sometimes even for our own good. But over time, we all come to realize that a lot of what we've been told to believe is misleading or outright incorrect. If it happens enough, and if the deceptions are meaningful enough, it might force you to rethink your entire perspective. And once your trust in an authority figure is broken, it's pretty much impossible to get it back. Welcome to the real world. The Matrix presents a future where people are very literally living in a simulation. And in The Matrix Reloaded, which I mostly don't want to talk about, the architect reveals that the machines went through multiple iterations just to get people to stop rejecting the system. Nearly 99% of all test subjects accepted the program as long as they were given a choice, even if they were only aware of the choice at a near unconscious level. Looking at the way real people have willingly chosen to segregate into their own bubbles of bad information, that sounds about right. The whole thing is basically Plato's allegory of the cave, where most people simply choose never to venture into reality, turned into a killer action movie. Now, personally, I don't seriously entertain the idea that we live in a simulation, certainly not one created by squid bots. But since the real point of all this is about shaping the way people think and how they experience the world through intentional deception and selectively limiting knowledge, I think the metaphorical theme of The Matrix works equally well for discussions about propaganda, media manipulation, and censorship. Propaganda is something I've spent a lot of time thinking about over the years, and I've come to realize that the term itself is frequently misused. Dictionary definitions aren't very helpful. 
Most essentially define it as information spread with the explicit goal of furthering a particular agenda. But that's way too broad. Accepting that definition would mean that any persuasive speech, any advertisement, and indeed almost any YouTube video that expresses an opinion would be considered propaganda. I don't really see how that makes sense. Better definitions clarify that propaganda is intentionally misleading and that those who promote it are deliberately attempting to deceive other people to further a specific goal. But even that feels a little thin. I think that what truly separates propaganda from other forms of persuasion is the degree to which the propagandist has the power to control access to information. The simulated reality of The Matrix is a good analog to propaganda because the people trapped in the system mostly don't and can't know anything other than what they're told by the machines. In real life, the most effective propaganda campaigns are almost always those run by authoritarian states like North Korea or China because they can dictate what people are allowed to read, watch, or listen to. Historically, most governments had that kind of authority, controlling speech, licensing publishers, and arresting, exiling, or executing dissidents who expressed criticism of people in power. Many of my own intellectual influences, like Voltaire or John Locke, did some of their best work on the run from the law. But it used to be the case in the more free societies that the public square couldn't really be censored without the use of obviously violent force, so critics could speak and be heard, or failing that, everyone else could at least see them getting physically silenced by those in power. But now, with the shift to digital communication on a small number of social networks, all based out of the same region and all run by people who share the same basic ideas about the world, censorship can be as easy as adding a few keywords or phrases to a blacklist in lines of code. And no one else can even see it happen. In fact, many people end up unwittingly posting into the void for days or weeks without even getting a warning that their words aren't reaching anyone. Ignorance is bliss. That happens a lot more often than most people want to believe, and it's the closest thing I can think of to actually living in the Matrix. Meanwhile, we're all still drowning in misinformation. When most people talk about this subject, they're usually referring to the stuff that comes from edgelords on 4chan, fringe nuts, and conspiracy theorists who think that 5G is a plot to give you cancer. Sure, that stuff exists, but it's not as important as most people think. What I'm talking about is the much more dangerous misinformation that saturates every aspect of our lives, surrounds our digital experiences, and is broadcast into each and every one of our homes by so-called authoritative sources. You might think I'm being hyperbolic, but I'm really not. America, as well as most every other relatively free country, still routinely employs state propaganda in an attempt to control our beliefs. We have more legal power to criticize the state than a lot of other places, yes. But what happens when our social networks and major media outlets are the ones that won't allow dissent? This, this is, is extremely, extremely dangerous, dangerous to our democracy. And what happens when the people we're all supposed to trust to provide accurate information about the world sacrifice truthful reporting in favor of telling stories that support their preferred narratives and agendas? Once you start seriously digging into the countless major stories that have been misreported or outright fabricated by the press, the innumerable lies told by politicians that are endlessly parroted and replayed around the world without question, and the coordinated suppression of information on social media that prevents ordinary people from effectively debating or challenging claims made by people in positions of power, you might feel like you've been unplugged from a fantasy world for the first time. I know, it all sounds very dystopian, maybe even a little crazy, but the examples of unreliable, malicious, and hopelessly biased media are literally too numerous to list, so I can only give a few that illustrate the point. You can check out the links in the description if you want to see more. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Let's start with Kyle Rittenhouse. As anyone who actually watched the video should have known, almost everything the media said about him for over a year was false. 
He did live in the community. His mother didn't drive him to Kenosha. He didn't carry a gun across state lines. He didn't fire the first shot. There's no evidence he was any kind of white supremacist. He was the one being chased, and he didn't fire at anyone who wasn't immediately attacking him. During his trial, the judge even dismissed a misdemeanor possession charge because the law only applied to handguns and short-barreled rifles, which was not what he was carrying. And yet, anyone arguing that the gun was legally in Kyle's possession was subjected to fact-check warnings and posting restrictions on Facebook. A year ago, if you'd suggested that a certain illness escaped from a lab instead of a wet market, your post would have been taken down and you'd have been scolded for sharing misinformation. Your account might have even gotten suspended. Although even at the time, those claims were all subject to debate. Meanwhile, the man whose department funded the lab in question has lied repeatedly under oath and intentionally misinformed people several times in the middle of a crisis. If you share his false statements on social media, no one cares. We've somehow accepted a world where Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube get to decide what is or is not true, and they will punish you for falling on the wrong side of that line. If you repeatedly post content they don't like, your account may be quietly silenced, temporarily blocked, or shut down for good. But they're terrible arbitrators of fact, and although plenty of people work hard to deny the obvious, their restrictions are clearly skewed by their ideological preferences. Fee recently shared a post from Spike Cohen that criticized adults who think that the IRS should monitor bank transactions under $600. Facebook's officially sanctioned fact checkers decided that this was somehow missing context because that policy is merely a proposal, not yet a law. But that was never the claim. The post simply states that there are people, adults no less, who believe the proposal is a good idea. For example, the politicians who proposed it. The same thing has happened with a ton of social posts about the thing I'm really not allowed to talk about on this platform. But we've seen dozens of cases where claims that got flagged as misinformation later turned out to be true, or at least debatable. And yet remember, Accounts that violate rules against misinformation get demoted in the algorithm or worse. At the same time, what somehow doesn't get fact check warnings are all the claims made by CNN, NBC, Washington Post, New York Times, and other news networks about all sorts of things they're willfully wrong about. Like Nicholas Sandman, mostly peaceful protests, the Steele dossier, and a lot more about the Russia collusion story. Jesse Smollett and several other hoaxed hate crimes, the absurd idea that critical race theory isn't being taught in schools, blatant denial of inflation and other serious economic problems, and various wild exaggerations about other issues. The list of botched stories over the last few years alone is endless, and there's a pretty clear pattern to what they're getting wrong. In general, it seems that whenever a false claim is made by a so-called authoritative source, it gets a pass. Narratives that support the interests and values of politicians and the people who run major news organizations, television and movie studios, and the social networks themselves are promoted and widely distributed. And yet, demonstrably true claims made by people challenging those narratives get squashed. This is a huge problem. But to solve it, we need to understand how we got here. I think the origin of this whole mess involves four main ingredients. Bad incentives, ideological bias, poor ethics, and too much concentrated power. The first of these is the simplest to demonstrate. Everyone is competing for attention. The most obvious way of attracting readers and viewers has always been to tell salacious stories and frame them with incredible headlines and imagery that pique the interests of anyone passing by. However, sensationalism comes at the expense of credibility, so there's normally a natural trade-off. Newspapers that want to build trust with a community over time need to maintain their readers' respect if they want to stay in business. So they can't just publish anything. But the incentives on the internet are different. News outlets no longer need to build trust with everyone who happens to live in the same town or county. And in the digital realm, it's easier to succeed by serving red meat to ideologically aligned fans all over the world. Sensationalism is also relative to the culture and to the competition. What was shocking and rare 50 years ago is completely fine today. 
What's more, the 24-hour news cycle creates incentives for every outlet to rush to judgment. So it's not surprising that a lot of journalists publish poorly sourced stories without verifying details or questioning the facts just to get there first. But that's how you end up with a whole industry full of unreliable reporting and not much competitive pressure to do better. And yes, reporters are biased. Everyone is. We all have a perspective, and we all filter facts and stories through that lens. This isn't a terrible problem, as long as you are self-aware enough to recognize it, correct for it as much as you can, and don't try to hide it from your audience. The bias of the media in general largely just reflects the biases of the individual writers, editors, and producers who work for each of the major outlets. And since the vast majority of the industry leans a certain direction, then we shouldn't be shocked when news stories are mostly told from that perspective. Add to this what I believe is a culture of poor ethics and bad training among journalists, who tend to be surprisingly young and who are now often more dedicated to activism and changing the world than any attempt at dispassionate truth-seeking. And the bad incentives and biases become a big issue. But that's not all. The most insidious problem is that the power to control what people see and hear is heavily concentrated in the hands of just a few networks and social media companies that mostly all behave the same way. They decide what shows up on your TV, your radio, and in your newsfeed, and they can make it extremely difficult for casual viewers to see information they don't want them to see. That's a lot of power, and it doesn't get used for good. Journalists have always had a creepy reverence for the words of the state officials and politicians they agree with, often presenting them as undeniable fact. And more often than not, news media and social networks work with governments to push the narratives that they want pushed, which means that they're complicit in spreading misinformation for the purpose of controlling behavior in a context where they have complete control over what people are allowed to see. That's genuine propaganda. Journalists even give themselves awards for badly written stories that are easily proven to be false. It often makes me wonder just how many people form strong opinions about important subjects that they'll never personally question based entirely on these kinds of lies and false reports, and how many hold on to their delusions long after the supporting facts have been retracted and debunked. At this point, relying on most journalists to provide accurate information assumes a level of competence and integrity that I honestly just don't think is wise. The trouble is, once you accept that these people can't be trusted, it gets really hard to figure out what to do next. But I think in its own way, The Matrix offers us an answer. Take the red pill. I can only show you the door. You have to walk through it. We're probably not trapped in a simulation, but a ton of people are blind to the misinformation that surrounds them every day. The good news is, you don't need to wait for people like Trinity, Morpheus, or Neo to help you. You can unplug yourself. All you have to do is adopt a much more skeptical attitude toward the stories that get broadcast and shared across your networks, especially those that confirm your biases play off of your worst fears and anxieties, or tell you exactly what you want to hear. Take more time thinking about an article before you share it, and ask questions of your information sources. Can they support their claims? Are their arguments logically sound? Do they just quote a representative of a government, corporation, or special interest group without verification, or did they actually check to see if the statements were true? If the report is about something for which there's lots of publicly available evidence, does their spin on the story align with what you see when you look at the evidence for yourself? There are a lot of ways for us all to become better at assessing the quality of the stories we accept. And the more time you spend practicing skepticism, the better you will become at shielding yourself from false information and bad ideas, no matter where they come from. If I can do anything positive with this series, I hope it's to get more people to wake up, break free from the matrix of bad information, and experience more of the real world as it actually is. Where we go from there is a choice I leave to you.
Hey everybody, thanks for watching this episode of Out of Frame. As tough as it can be to have these kinds of conversations on YouTube now, I still think it's an important place to communicate and share information. But I'd also like to remind everyone that every episode of this series and Common Sense Soapbox is available on Odyssey as well. I'm hoping that over time they will continue to grow and the competition will help shift some of the policies on other social networks. What do you think? Leave a comment and let's talk about it. In the meantime, join us on Discord. Check out our weekly behind the scenes podcast. If you love Out of Frame, please consider a monthly contribution on Patreon or Subscribestar. Supporters get a private channel on Discord, free swag, and access to other cool stuff. And speaking of our supporters, I want to give a special shout out to our associate producers. To Connor McGowan, Richard Lawrence, Matt Tabor, and Vegas Starlight, thank you. Lastly, be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel, ring that bell icon, and if you really want to make sure you see everything we publish and get even more exclusive content, join the weekly Out of Frame email list. And as always, don't forget to find us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, and Instagram. I'll see you next time.